Hello, welcome back. Blake Rudis with EverydayHDR and HDRinsider.com. And today I want to show you a really wicked trick. And it's how you can use Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw to actually process a 32-bit, wait for it, wait for it, Photomatix HDR image. Not a merged HDR Pro 32-bit in Photoshop. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a 32-bit image out of Photomatix and process it in Photoshop CC using Adobe Camera Raw. This is a really awesome trick, and at the end, I'll show you the difference between why you want to do something like this with Photomatix as opposed to uh, using Merged HDR Pro. There are some slight differences. So what you're looking at right now is an ugly tone-mapped image. What you're looking at right now is a very nice, clean, 32-bit processed image from Photomatix into Photoshop. So we got a lot to talk about. Let's go. So typically when we think about HDR, we think tone mapped. And this image that you're looking at is a tone mapped image straight out of Photomatix. It's not bad. It needs some work. Definitely needs to be post-processed. This is straight out of Photomatix. But there's other things that we can do. And a lot of times you think 32-bit processing and you use Merge to HDR Pro for that in Photoshop. But did you know that you can use Adobe Camera Raw to post-process a 32-bit Photomatix image? Okay. So let me say that again. You can use Adobe Camera Raw in Photoshop CC to modify a 32-bit image out of Photomatix instead of Merge to HDR. And why would you want to do this? Well, let's look at this tone mapped image and see that there's definitely some things in here that we don't want. This, this image definitely needs something more uh, kind of natural looking and not this grunge feel. Okay. So we're going to do this in Photomatix first. So what we're going to do is going to go into bridge. And what you're seeing here are six images that I used. I did, I shot for seven, but the negative two image that you see here is a one four thousandth. My camera doesn't go any higher than that. So that last uh, bracketed shot, that seventh shot was just another one four thousandth by default for my camera. So I use these six images to process this. I definitely needed six for this one because the way I was shooting and how the sun is right here and just the dynamic range that was in this scene. I tried to do it with just three and I knew for a fact it wasn't going to work. So I switched over to seven real quick and took seven shots. So why I like bridge is I can just drag and drop these right into Photomatix and start working. So yes, we want to merge for HDR processing. Press OK before you skip this part. OK, this is where it is. See where it says show 32 bit unprocessed image. In past versions, it was called the intermediary 32 bit image. I'm not sure if this is checked by default or not but check this. So there's a little check box there and press OK. This is important. We need that 32 bit image. Now I know that this was taken on a tripod and I do want to show some methods for deghosting. And it's going to go ahead and run its little algorithm and smash all those brackets together for me. And here we are. Okay. So typically with deghosting, I could do selective deghosting. And if I do selective deghosting and grab right around here, just for the water, cause I know that that's where the motion is. And I press preview deghosting. You see that I get a lot of, um, tone compression here in the back part of these highlights. And I don't want that. So instead of doing that, I'm going to go to automatic deghosting. Now this is a pretty cool feature because you can actually use the movement in one uh, of the frames as what it's going to set its baseline off of for the deghosting. So this is a pretty cool feature, but it comes with some drawbacks. The higher you go with this, if you go to very strong, you're going to get a reduced quality in your image. So I usually go right between mild and medium, and then I'll select maybe uh, this one looks good. So I know that at one five thirteenth of a second, there's not going to be too much movement in there in this scene. And what this is going to do is it's going to prevent any ghosting from happening in the photograph. So right now it's going to merge to HDR and typically when it's done with this, it would either dump you into the tone mapping part or the contrast optimizer, depending on how it is that you choose to go with in Photomatix. But what I'm going to do is when it shows me my 32 bit image, you're going to see it here. Typically this is where you press tone map or fuse. Well, now we're just going to go to file and save as and save this as that dot HDR file. That's your 32 bit dot HDR file. So we'll go ahead and press save and we can go ahead and close this out. We don't need this anymore. And now we're back in bridge and you can see here's our dot HDR file. It looks horrible, right? But bridge recognizes it. Photoshop recognizes it. When I double click it, it's going to open right in Photoshop. 
Okay, so if I press Control Shift and A, Control Shift A is the hotkey in Photoshop CC to get into Adobe Camera Raw. I say that specifically because I know I'm going to get questions. Why can't I do this in Photoshop CS6? Well, because Photoshop CS6 did not come with Camera Raw as a filter. You have to have Camera Raw as a filter for this to work. Control Shift A, Command Shift A on a Mac, and that's going to bring us into Adobe Camera Raw. So now we can edit this .hdr 32-bit file, which is huge, mind you. It's a 230 megabyte file. So a lot of people wonder, why would I use 32-bit images? And why is this so blown out? What would you ever do with that? Well, the thing about a 32-bit image is it has so much dynamic range in it. Watch this. That when you go all the way to the right, it's pure white. But as you go all the way to the left, look at our whites. They start coming back to the point that even those clouds up there almost turn pure black. There is a ton of dynamic range in here more than 10 exposures, uh, so more exposure values, I should say. And that is pretty crazy. So we'll go ahead and bring the exposure down here so we can get the, the, the clouds right there. And what I'm gonna do is just kind of set this up so that my highlights look pretty good and my shadows look pretty good. Open up those areas down there so that those shadows open up and we can see the foreground and we can see the background. I'll change my whites so that there is some white there. If you press Alt or Option when you click on the whites, it'll show you where your whites are clipping or blowing out. You can also see it on your histogram here that as we move this to the right, our histogram starts to touch the right hand side and that's where things are pure white and things can be pure white there. I'll let that be pure white. That's one of those highlights that happens in nature. So I'll let that be pure white. I'm gonna bring my contrast up a little bit. And if we see here, I could really try and, you know, try to fuddle and, and fix these, these sliders to get this just right, but it's probably just not going to happen right here. So what I can do is go into the adjustment brush, click on the adjustment brush. And what I'm going to do is if you click any of the plus or minus signs here, it will automatically set your brush up for just, let's say, uh, in the shadows, just plus 25. So now everything's reset so that the only thing that's being affected here is that plus 25 in the shadows. Now I'm going to press auto mask and then mask, and I'm going to brush right here on my image. Now you'll see that I'm using a magenta color for my mask to show me my mask. This is just showing me where my mask is going to be. And this is really a nice feature here. Um, the, the thing is the, the reason why I use magenta as my color is that magenta really doesn't happen that often in nature. It's not very often that we see magenta jumping out at us as we go across this uh, scene, unless you're maybe in some, I don't know, uh, springs or something like that. So if you click right here, you can actually change the color. I think by default it's set to red. I could be wrong. Uh, I've had mine set as magenta for so long. I can't even uh, tell you. So the magenta is a good color because it's not a color that happens very often in nature. So now we can unclick this mask so we don't see it anymore. And now we can adjust the shadows for just that uh, portion that we selected in our mask. So I can bring the highlights up a little bit. I can maybe bring the exposure up a little bit, bring some of that out, maybe bring the contrast up to get some more color in there. Uh, definitely give me a heightened contrast between light and dark there. Maybe exposure up just a little bit more. And then we can even maybe make this a little bit more green by adding a little bit more yellow and a little bit more green. And now I can select a new brush and I want to reset these settings. I'm going to do this for the water. And I know just by looking at the water, I want it to be a little bit uh, more white. So I can just go increase a little bit on my exposure and again, show the mask and we'll paint for just the water. Okay. If you go a little bit over, it's okay. You can press alt or option and that will get you into the negative uh, so that you're not adding to this mask, your alt or option to, to brush away. So sometimes it's a good idea to overbrush and then just over correct with the alter option. Okay, so that looks about good for the selection of the water. We'll press the mask. And now if we increase the highlights, you can see that we're bringing up the highlights in those water and just the water. And we can do this with the shadows and the, the shadows in there as well. Now, the thing about this being a 32 bit image, there is a ton of dynamic range in here. So the detail that's happening there is just absolutely incredible. And what you can do with these uh, clarity adjustments and everything, you can pretty much get grungy on this too, but we don't want to do that. Now with the temperature of the water, we can make it a little bit bluer, uh, maybe add a little bit more uh, green to that, just a slight bit more green to that to kind of give it its natural color. Uh, I don't know if I want to increase the saturation there. Probably just leave that alone. So I can increase, uh, definitely might want to increase the highlights a little bit more just to make that a little bit brighter, especially you get this area blowing out right here. We'll let that be a blow up.
So now I can select a new brush and now I can paint for my background. And again, we want to show the mask on there. And you see, I didn't reset my settings. I did that on purpose so that you could see that what it's going to do is it's going to pull all the settings from the last brush that I used, from the last adjustment that I used. And that's pretty bad up here. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and reset all these back down to where they were and we'll do some adjustments for the sky. So with the sky, we can actually uh, probably make that a little bit brighter by increasing the uh, exposure. And then we'll maybe increase the highlights just a tad, just a very little bit, maybe drop down the shadows a little bit. No, bring those shadows up a little bit to open up this area back here. And then we can increase the clarity a little bit to kind of give those clouds a little bit of definition, and then maybe even increase the saturation in there so that those clouds get that nice blue that they are. And we can remove some of the yellow from up there by adding some temperature adjustment there by getting us into the blue. So now let's go back to where we were before. Here was that HDR image before, and here it is now. So let's go ahead and open this up and see what we're working with. Now from here, it's still probably going to be a 32-bit image. So what we can do is we can go to image uh, mode and then change this to 16 bits. And when we change it to 16 bits, it's going to ask us, because it knows it's an HDR image, it's going to ask us to tone map it. Well, we don't have to tone map it. We can just go right here to where it says exposure and gamma. Don't make any adjustments and press OK. So what that's going to do is just give us our camera raw settings. And that was with our Photomatix 32-bit image. So let's go ahead and go back into bridge. And what I did here was I already did this entire process with a Photoshop 32 bit image. So we can just drag and drop this right on top of our Photomatix image. And you can see here that now the difference between the two, this one, we'll just go ahead and rename it to Photoshop. This is the merge to HDR pro version. So I use merge to HDR pro merge those six images, just like you would if you're creating a 32 bit image in Photoshop and I compared them and contrasted them directly to each other. So if we zoom in here, you can see that some of the highlights here are kind of blown out in the Photoshop version. Uh, there's some slight uh, exaggeration on those chromatic aberrations. I pretty much use the exact same settings too. Now the water, this is the important part. Look at how blown out this water is. That was not able to be resurrected from the 32 bit image, but look at what happened with the uh, Photomatix version. With the Photomatix version, there's actually some definition there still in that blowout area, but it didn't quite get recovered the way it should have with the Photoshop version. Now they're very, very close and not, not so far away that I would say don't use Merge HDR Pro. Uh, you can still use Merge HDR Pro. I just wanted to show you a little uh, difference here. Now, even over here in, in some of the highlight areas on the dirt in the Photoshop one, they're very uh, bright, but in the Photomatix version, that 32 bit renders them a little bit more accurate to the detail that was actually there instead of that, that highlight blowout that you kind of get there. But like I said, many of the settings I used were exactly the same. So this is the difference between the, this is the Photomatix version and this is the Photoshop version. The only real difference here is that maybe I could have gotten a little bit brighter on this Photomatix version. So I can actually just bring up the exposure just a little bit on here. No, I don't want to bring up the exposure, maybe a curve adjustment on here and just bring up just a slight bit to kind of match how bright the Photoshop version is. So again, my name is Blake Rudis with Everyday HDR and HDR Insider. If you like this, please comment on it, share it. And if you like, go ahead and subscribe to me because I come out with these tutorials in pretty much weekly. So uh, if you see something you like here, I'm pretty sure you got another HDR friend that likes uh, to see this type of knowledge too, because we typically don't see 32 bit processing in the HDR world happening from the intermediary Photomatix images, usually with the HDR Pro from Photoshop. And you can see here that sometimes we get better results with Photomatix. Thank you very much for watching.